Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on. And um, it sounds like it's been a great conference so far. Yeah. So uh, welcome to the first Metabolic Health Conference, Dr. Alex. So I would also like to thank you for accepting the invite on behalf of our team and the organizers. And before we start with the hypothyroidism, let me just first introduce you to our viewers. So viewers, uh, Dr. Alex is graduated from the University of Tasmania in 2008. He has later worked in the various teaching hospitals and to his credit, he has added the number of articles published in the International Journal during his work at experience at Sydney Cancer Services. So, and his postgraduate qualifications includes a fellowship from the College of General Practitioners, and he has also earned a diploma in child health from Sydney University. So, to further add to this, he took nutrition training from Nutrition Network. He is a foundation member of Society of Metabolic Health Practitioner, and he is also a member of Low Carb Down Under and he has presented several times in the low carb conferences. And now being very passionate about the low carb nutrition, he is practicing low carb nutrition, both as a GP and also within the Sydney low carb specialist. He has seen the immense benefits of low carb nutrition that he's always keen to share his learnings with others. And today he is here with us to give his insights on hypothyroidism. So welcome again, Dr. Alex. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Alex, before we get into our topic, I would just like you to tell us in brief what took your interest in the low carb nutrition as a GP. And sure. I yes. Like, uh, could you also tell, like, is, was there some turning point came to your life that you came up with the this low carb Sydney low carb clinic, and now you have made this available for many many people? Sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, I started off my career in a bit of a different trajectory. So as you mentioned, I started off working in cancer services. So I spent several years working as an oncologist. And so in, in that field, you're really looking at the other end of the spectrum where you're seeing people who are already very sick and already in very dire circumstances. So I never really got to see a lot of the preventative health. And um, after a few years of that, I got a bit jaded and burnt out with that. So uh, along with my wife, Dr. Deepa Mahananda, who also spoke at the conference a few days ago, um, we both went into the the world of preventative care or primary practice or general practice. Uh, and so when we started there, you, you, you immediately are uh, seeing a very different kind of patient or a very different kind of medicine. And so all of a sudden, rather than dealing, dealing with acute medicine, we were both just inundated with all this chronic disease um, that we'd never really seen in the hospital or never really managed properly anyway. So we were just um, seeing all this hypertension, this diabetes, obesity, all of these things, and none of these patients were getting better. We were following the guidelines and putting them on one medication, then another medication, and then the third medication to manage the side effect of the first medication. And so... Um, we really felt like we needed to do something different. So Deeper and I sat back and said, all right, well, we need to go back to the evidence and find a way to fix this because we're not actually fixing these people. And that's where we came across uh, low carbohydrate medicine and ketogenic diets. And um, primarily through, I guess, the lens of obesity and type two diabetes. But, you know, once we started reading more about ketogenic physiology, the, the, the use cases expanded quite rapidly. And so, and so we started treating our patients. You know, we started with the worst of the worst, the you know severe obesity or severe di type two diabetes, and immediately got good results. And this was back in I think 2016, so some time ago now. So once we started, you know, getting that success, then that really spurred us on, and it's quite inspiring when you you're reversing diabetes and fixing all of these chronic conditions. And so that grew in our practice, and it got to the point where. In our in our general practice, uh, our our days were blowing out because our, the consults typically are long. When you're seeing patients for low carbohydrate medicine, they don't fit into the typical ten or fifteen minute consultation that general practice in Australia usually has. So, so that's when we decided we needed to have a separate clinic to really basically put some time aside to so that we can do the long consults as we as we needed to do. And that's that's really where Sydney Low Carb um, Specialist was born. So we've got a specialist clinic here in Sydney that's got um, doctors, which has selves, a dietitian, health coach, and an exercise physiologist. So we've really tried to make it as as a collaborative and um, holistic approach as possible, really. And so in that sort of um, vein, we're able to treat patients uh, 
for a variety of different conditions now. So um, it seems to be the use cases for ketogenic diets and low carb is just getting bigger and bigger. So now we're seeing all sorts of different things, you know, mental health, cancer, we see now preventative health, um, neurodegenerative diseases and thyroid problems. So that was the thyroid disease was not one of the first things on our radar when we first started looking into low carbohydrate medicine. Um, but because we see so many patients with thyroid disease and because metabolic disease and thyroid disease go hand in hand quite often, then that has really prompted this look into how to manage thyroid disease properly. Fantastic. You people are really doing fantastic work, you know. So a lot to learn from you people, not only about thyroid, but, you know. Uh, so, Dr. Alex, let's just start with the definition of hypothyroidism. What actually hypothyroidism is? Yeah, so so hypothyroidism is in essence an underactive thyroid. And so to understand what that means, it's probably worthwhile looking into what the thyroid actually does. So your thyroid gland is a small butterfly-shaped gland that sits in the front of your neck. Um, and its main function is to produce something called thyroid hormone. Uh, and this thyroid hormone has many, many functions. So it governs your basal metabolic rate. It regulates cellular metabolism. It, in, it has a role in determining uh, the number of mitochondria in your cells and how active they are. It has a role with temperature regulation and protein synthesis. Uh, it has a very important role with growth and development um, from fetal life up to adulthood. Uh, and it also has a role when it comes to lipid breakdown and, um, and neurotransmitter functions. So many, many um, different actions within the body, many organs affected. So when the thyroid is not working well, you can actually also get a, a whole host of different symptoms. So when the, th when the body's not making enough thyroid hormones, so in other words, when you've got hypothyroidism or an underactive thyroid, um, many of the symptoms you get are related to this decrease in metabolic rate. So people are tired, they get low heart rate, they can have brain fog or decreased concentration, they can feel cold all the time. Uh, they can gain weight despite having a poor appetite. Uh, a lot of people with hypothyroidism will also uh, describe hair loss, cold, dry skin, cold peripheries, especially cold hands, uh, muscle weakness, constipation. So all of these symptoms are really related to decreased metabolic rate. You can get some other symptoms that are not quite related to metabolic rate. So that includes depression, decreased libido, um, heavy periods or absent periods in women. Uh, and the last thing you can get, if you've got hypothyroidism, you can get a goiter, which is basically an enlargement of the thyroid gland, which is rarer these days, but ha has been described and can happen sometimes, although it's, it's thankfully it's getting rarer. So, so these are all the sort of problems you can get with um, hypothyroidism or an underactive thyroid. Now, worldwide, there's three main causes of hypothyroidism. So one is congenital, which we thankfully don't see that often. So that is typically a more a severe case with babies that are failing to thrive. Um, iodine deficiency is the most common cause worldwide. And thankfully in Australia, it's not um, not that common nowadays because we've got a lot of iodine fortification of grains and salt and, and whatnot. But the Eastern Seaboard Australia is, is fairly iodine deficient. Um, and my understanding is India is quite iodine deficient when it comes yes. to the soil. So... So there are certain parts of the world where it's not a problem, but uh, large portions of the world, the soil is is not um, as replete with iodine as you would like. And unfortunately, modern farming practices probably make it worse. Yeah. So that's why people will often see that their salt has been fortified or certain mm -hmm. grains and um, other foodstuffs are fortified with iodine because otherwise we might not get enough um, not enough in. And the, the other major cause of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune disease where the body's <clears> immune <throat> system essentially attacks the thyroid gland. <clears throat> and as a result, um, it doesn't make as much thyroid hormone as it, as it otherwise would. So, so they're the main causes. In terms of how we diagnose it, we usually diagnose hypothyroidism based on a couple of blood tests that you can get done with your doctor. So the first one is called TSH, um, and the second two are called T4 and T3. So how it works is TSH is that stands for thyroid stimulating hormone and it's a hormone your pituitary gland and your brain produces and its job is basically to push your thyroid gland to pump out T4. Now T4 is uh, in a fairly weak or inactive version of thyroid hormone but that's what your thyroid pr predominantly pumps out and its job is to go out into the tissues and get converted to T3. Now T3 is the 
really the active thyroid hormones. That's what we really want. And it's, it's the one that's producing most of the effects that I described before. Uh, so if you want to have a full picture of what's going on with your thyroid, you need all three of those tests. You need TSH, T4, T3, but mm -hmm. commonly um, in, in the medical world, a TSH is the only test that's done. And the, the rationale behind that is this, this idea that if the TSH is normal, then the T4 and T3 should be normal, so we shouldn't bother testing for it. Mm -hmm. But that's not always the case, and we might, we might uh, delve into that a bit later on. So when you've got hypothyroidism, your TSH should be high. Mm -hmm. And that's really because the pituitary gland's not happy with how much thyroid hormone is around, so it's trying to push the thyroid gland to make more. And if the thyroid gland can't make more, then what you would typically see is that the T4 and usually the T3 are lower than expected. And so that's a di that's consistent with a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Uh, so Dr. Alex, so just uh, this hypothyroidism testing is just, it ends at these thyroid hormone testing, like T4, TSH and T3, or we need to look into something else, like, you know, because as you mentioned before, as well, like we were talking before the session, like it, uh, this uh, diabetes, which is uh, insulin resistance and the hypothyroidism, they both go hand in hand. So there is, do you suspect that there is some connection between these two? Like, like we also need to look into the metabolic panel as well. If someone is like having a hypothyroidism uh, symptoms, but they have TSH, T4, T3, everything is normal. But they still have like a hypothyroidism symptoms. So what else we can see? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good question. So a lot of the times in medicine, <clears throat> people are treated not as people, but as numbers. So you just basically get told, oh, look, if the numbers are normal, you're normal or it's in your head or whatever it might be. Um, one important thing that people don't realize is um, T3 uh, is very intricately related to, to how your insulin is functioning in your body. So in essence, if you are insulin resistant, you are thyroid resistant. So the cell needs more T3 to get the job done. In fact, there's evidence that in hypothyroidism, the, the amount of insulin receptors on fat cells is actually increased quite dramatically. However, the amount of uh, insulin-induced glucose use, utilization by the cell actually goes down by as much as 60%. Mm -hmm. so, so T3 levels correlate um, somewhat with insulin levels. And so anything that reduces insulin levels in the blood is generally going to reduce T3 levels in the blood as well, because your body doesn't need as much of it. Um, now, the other thing is to get T3 into the cell, we don't just need the T3, we need appropriate insulin signaling. We also need zinc, we need vitamin A. Uh, and that's probably a good segue to talk about the nutrients we need yeah. for a healthy thyroid. So for your thyroid gland to pump out T4, it needs a few important building blocks of substrates. Uh, probably the most important one is iodine. So we already touched on that. Um, but the, there are some other nutrients that are really critical as well. One of them is iron. One of them is zinc. One of them is selenium. Um, certain B vitamins and vitamin D are also relevant. On the flip side, there are some factors that can actually inhibit your thyroid's ability to pump out T4. So that includes stress, infection, um, certain toxins, pesticides, autoimmune diseases, and actually fluoride. So a lot of people have fluoride in the water now, but um, it's another not well-known fact. But fluoride is actually antagonistic to iodine because uh, they're both halogen compounds. So <clears throat> fluoride actually displaces iodine um, in the body. So so, so that's... So uh, it means like we should also look, look into the inflammatory markers like to really diagnose the hypothyroidism. So is it? Yeah, they they're going to have a role. Yes. So um so to get T4 to so to convert T4 to T3, we also need a few factors. So selenium and zinc again relevant. Um but yes, absolutely. The inflammation actually stops you from uh, converting T4 to T3 as well. So I mean inflammation has so many effects on the body, but uh inhibiting your body's ability to to convert t4 to t3 is one of the many many issues with chronic inflammation so again it's no surprise that in people who are chronically inflamed um hypothyroidism or the symptoms of hypothyroidism uh can come up again and again and again okay. uh now um coming back to selenium you know like uh you're talking about selenium that it helps with the conversion and you know nowadays uh people i know you know whoever like who's having the symptoms of hypothyroidism or they are diagnosed with hypothyroidism everybody is taking the thyroid formulas 
and they contain all the micronutrients that you mentioned and selenium is there. Do you think that uh, one should really take all those micronutrients without even knowing that they have, they are really deficient in those micronutrients and even for the long term people are taking, are there any complications to attach to that? Um, yeah, potentially, yeah. So selenium comes in two forms. One is the organic form that we're going to get from food typically, and there is a synthetic form. The synthetic form, it is possible to build it up in the blood uh, and it can cause oh. problems. Thankfully, it's rare. Um, but the the important take home is the organic form of selenium, you've got much more leeway with. So it's actually harder to run into problems with overload if you're getting it from food. So so generally our philosophy in the clinic is always supplements are supplemental. Um, then we use them if we need to, but if we don't need to, then we'd always prefer to just get it from food because it's far and away the better way to get it. And it's always going to be cheaper or almost always going to be cheaper as well. Um, there is some evidence that, you know, selenium and zinc supplementation does improve the symptoms of hypothyroidism. So even within the conventional medicine space, a lot of endocrinologists will now use that. But I think in some regards, it's it's missing the point, which is that a lot of the hypothyroidism we see is actually due to malnutrition and because people are not getting enough of these nutrients in. So um, it's a common criticism that we get... Um, level towards low carb diets that are you know you shouldn't be on a low carb diet because it's going to be harmful to your thyroid and that's a pretty unfounded statement but it's just an it's typically an act of desperation from people who are trying to convince people to knock on a low carb diet so usually they try cholesterol first or saturated fat is going to kill you or if you don't get enough fiber that's going to kill you yeah. but once all those avenues have been exhausted one of the last things they might say is oh it's bad for your thyroid as well you know yeah. um and it's just there's just no evidence for that so i mean we talked about those nutrients before the the ones that are critical if we just go through them one by one and look at which foods yeah. have they're these good. nutrients then it's quite it, it can be quite obvious as to where you're going to get them so yeah My if we start with is, i just i wanted like you know uh, how one can you know really uh, now, in the natural way, we can compensate with the deficiencies that we have, like of all these micronutrients. And does low carb really help with this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, a lot of the foods, or well, to, to get these nutrients, you don't have to be low carb. But if we look at the foods that are most nutrient dense, they tend to be low carb foods. So if we look at zinc, the best source of zinc is oysters by a long, long, long way. But a lot of people can't get that or they don't eat them. They don't like the taste of them. Um, the other rich sources of zinc are going to be other meat products. So red meat, chicken, um, seafood, pork. Um, we can get it from vegetarian sources. So almonds, pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, cheese, they are good sources of zinc. Okay, yeah. The other thing to note with zinc is the anti-nutrients that are found in grains and legumes and certain nuts that actually stop you absorbing zinc. So often on a low-carb oh. diet, we are getting people off the grains. So that actually helps you absorb zinc in the first place. If we look at selenium, the best source of selenium by a long way is Brazil nuts. Mm -hmm. So whether you're vegetarian or not, Brazil nuts are a great option. In fact, you only need one or two of them to get, you know, your, your full quota of um, selenium for the day. So you mentioned selenium supplements, you know, it's so much cheaper and easier to just get it from food. Yeah. Seafood's a great source of selenium. Um, eggs are a great source. Spinach is pretty good as well. And the other green leafy vegetables. So again, whether you're vegetarian or not, you have options to get selenium. Iron is a little bit tricky. So iron comes in two forms. So a lot of people will be aware that it comes in heme iron, which is basically found in meats. And it's very well absorbed that way. And it also comes in the non-heme iron form. So that's what we're going to need to get if we're if we're vegetarian. And so um, things like spinach or other green leafy vegetables tend to be pretty good with um, non-heme iron. A lot of fortified foods will have iron fortified in it. So that might need to be an option for certain people as well. Um, uh, and otherwise, dark chocolate, um, peanut butter, soybeans, spinach, um, artichokes, they're all uh, okay sources of, um, of non-heme iron. Mm -hmm. the, the fourth nutrient that we pay attention to when it comes to thyroid health is vitamin A. And similar to iron, it comes in two forms, the animal form, which is retinol, and you get that from eggs, dairy, liver, other meats, so lots of different options. And then the the plant form of vitamin A. So you typically get that in the orange foods. So um, carrot, sweet potato, pumpkin, mango, that sort of thing. You'll get some in spinach and capsicum and, and whatnot as well. Um, so you've got lots of options there as well. And the final thing is iodine. So we talked, we mentioned that before. So 
Iodine comes from things in the sea, so seafood, fish, um, uh, shellfish. I, um, seaweed is another great source of iodine. So again, whether you're vegetarian or not, that's a good way to get it. Uh, and also iodized salt, which is another easy way to make sure you're getting some in your diet. So they're sort of the big five nutrients I look at when it comes to thyroid health. And you can see on a low-carb diet, many options. In fact, with several of those nutrients, it's it's likely that it's going to be optimal that you're low carb because the grains really stop you absorbing things like zinc and iron. So um, if we can get more of these nutrients in, then your thyroid is going to have a much easier time of it. But what about the amino acids? Certain amino, amino acids. acids. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't want to be protein deficient. That causes many, many problems. So there are certain yes. amino acids that are... Um, uh, particularly helpful for the thyroid um but that being said generally speaking we don't we don't isolate those out in our clinical practice because you you need all the amino acids anyway yeah. so typically if we're getting them from whole proteins um then we're not going to run into problems like specifically for the vegetarians it's difficult don't you think it, it can be it can be so again if you're vegetarian um you ideally want to be eating whole proteins that way you know you're getting all the relevant amino acids so for vegetarians who can eat dairy or eggs great that's a fantastic source if not then um soy products can be helpful because they they do there are complete protein as well mm -hmm. or whey protein isolate for, um, for people who can um, tolerate that so there's different options, but yeah, generally speaking, if we're not getting it from whole proteins, then it can be easy to get unbalanced levels of the different amino acids where you might be getting more of one, but not as much of another. Mm -hmm. And vitamin D, like if it's a Hashimoto case, like is it autoimmune? Yep. Vitamin so vitamin D, D is certainly important. Um, and uh, there's many different ways to get that, I guess. So we, you know, sun sunshine will help or sun sun exposure helps. Um, vitamin D rich foods tend to be sort of fatty foods given it's fat soluble vitamins. So um, seafood is a good source. Uh, eggs, eggs are a decent source as well. You get some in dairy. Um, so absolutely vitamin D can be helpful. And a lot of people are vitamin D deficient, which can yeah. be a major issue. And that's not just Hashimoto's, it's other autoimmune diseases as well. You can run into problems with vitamin D. Uh, so, Dr. Alex, we uh, talked about DSH, T4, and T3. So, T4 and T3, which are floating in the blood, and they are available to utilize uh, mm -hmm. by the cells. But uh, what about reverse T3, where it is actually produced inside the body, and is it really important to measure? Yeah, so it, it can be. So, reverse T3 is a bit of a controversial topic. So, a lot of standard medical practitioners don't put any value in it. But, um, you know, the physiology is is well described. So, when your body makes T4, uh, mm -hmm. its eventual destiny is is mostly to get converted to T3. And as we mentioned before, that's the active thyroid hormone. So, it's, it's speeding up the metabolism and, and doing all that work. A different way the T4 can be converted is into something called reverse T3, which, as the name implies, is basically the mirror image of T3. Whereas T3 is speeding up the metabolism, um, helping the body burn energy, reverse T3 is basically pumping the brakes, slowing everything down. It's like a hibernation hormone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's got a job in the body. And if without it, um, we'd run into major problems with too much um, T3. But in some people, um, if they don't convert that T4 to T3, then the only way that T4 can can go is to get converted into reverse T3. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, that can be a major problem because you can look at their blood test and their TSH looks normal, their T3 looks mm -hmm. normal, their T4 looks perfect, yeah. um, but they've still got all the classical symptoms of hypothyroidism. And, it's, and if you look at their reverse T3, sometimes it's sky high. And so even though the T3 looks normal, they are functionally hypothyroid because the reverse mm -hmm. T3 is basically blocking the activity of T3 completely. Um, these patients can be very tricky to treat um, because the, the causes of high reverse T3 are, are, are very numerous. So autoimmune disease is one thing we look for in patients with high reverse T3. Um, Biotoxin-related illness or SIRS or mold-related disease, we typically see very high reverse T3 in those patients. Stress, um, in uh, sleep de deprivation, all that sort of hypothalamus, adrenal access dysfunction can also cause major issues with high reverse T3, uh, as can other autoimmune um, uh, problems, which can cause issues in the gut. So, so really with high reverse T3, if that's a problem, 
um, you really need to address the underlying cause. Until you can get down to why it's high, um, you can't fix it. It's very difficult to, to treat. But you will see patients like that. So we've seen patients in our clinic who are on 900, mili my, uh, 900 micrograms of thyroxine a day, oh which they've just been sort of going up and up and up and up with, a, with their usual doctor. And obviously, more, more T4 is not the answer for these patients because all that's happening is they're having this T4 in a supplement form and it's just getting converted to reverse T3 and it's just making the issue worse. So, yeah. so we will see it sometimes. Okay. So, but what about, you know, uh, this reverse T3, which is produced inside the cell, uh, what actually is, is, there are various factors which are driving the conversion of T4 to the reverse T3. But when we see in the lab, you know, normal lab range, it's a broad range. So uh, yep. when should somebody really actually get concerned about the numbers they have about of the reverse T3 and reverse T3, uh, like as a single variable, does it really depict something or we have to see it in relevance with some other thyroid hormone? Yeah, so in isolation, it's not that useful, but you could you could argue that most blood tests are not that useful in isolation. So it, has to, it always has to be put into context. So um, usually when we look at the blood test, uh, we want to see a few ratios as a rough standard of thumb. So as a rule of thumb, um, the ratio between T4 to T3 should be about three to one. So for every uh, three T4s, we should have one T3 or thereabouts. Okay. And mm -hmm. the ratio between T3 and reverse T3 should be about one to 100. So for every one point of T3, we'd like to see about 100 reverse T3. Oh. Yeah. So that doesn't hold for everyone, but that's just a, a rule of thumb to sort of show where someone's at. And there's some studies showing that that's, those optimal ratios tend to correlate well with not having hypothyroid symptoms. So do you, uh, do you really uh, prescribe the T3 as a medication in such patients who have really a high value of reverse T3? Yeah, uh, sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. So um, just for, for all the what the people watching, there's really three main ways we can supplement um, thyroid hormone for people who've got hypothyroidism. One is called thyroxine or T4, and that's mm -hmm. by far the most common way to do it these days. Uh, that's always our preference is that people can take the T4 and ideally they their body will convert it to T3 as needed. And that just makes it so much easier because T4 has a long half-life, so it's easy to give. Um, you can actually get desiccated thyroid, in other words, uh, ground up pig thyroid. And that's what used to be done before thyroxine was um, formulated. And the advantage of that is it has some T3 in it. It's a kind of a mix of T4 and T3. So for some patients, that will be helpful. If they're not converting their T4 to T3 appropriately, then desiccated thyroid can sometimes be helpful. And the last way to give it, <clears throat> as you mentioned, is synthetic T3. So you can actually get synthetic T3. We generally don't want to use that if we can avoid it because synthetic T3 has a very short half-life. So dosing it can be quite complex. And also it's a bit more, it's a bit less forgiving when it comes to hyperthyroidism. So if you give too much T3, it can cause some major problems in the body. It can cause uh, cardiac issues with arrhythmias or palpitations. It can also um, churn through your bone. So it can cause osteoporosis. So um, it's not something we want to give, but in some patients, that's the only thing that's going to make them feel better. Now, the problem with T3 is when to dose it. So naturally in the body, given it's a hormone, that's it's really around energy production and basal metabolic rate um, you would think giving it during the day would be um, the most logical time but um, actually your t3 peaks overnight when you're asleep so if you were actually going to do t3 supplementation properly you'd want to take it at 2 or 3 a.m now that's obviously not practical for most people so um, we typically dose it uh, once or twice a day in the mornings and so it's not perfect to do it that way, but it's it's better than nothing for some patients. And in those patients who need T3, I think we should still be looking for underlying causes of why they're not converting T3 or why they're high, their reverse T3 is so high. So you can just put a bandit for some time and later on, you know, meanwhile, we can look at the root cause, is it? Yeah, it's a pretty good band-aid. So some people who've been just given T4, you know, T4, 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 once they get T3 within a day, they feel better. And obviously then all they want is more T3 and you have to tell them, no, you can't keep taking more of this. Um, but certainly for some patients, it makes a huge difference.
uh, so Dr. Alex, you mentioned like, you know, we need the insulin signaling both for the production of thyroid hormone and for the uptake by the cells or the, for the conversion as well. So, but uh, does it mean that low carb, very low carb is not good for the hypothyroidism cases? Because we see the drastic drop in the insulin levels in many people like Yep. So not at all. So as I mentioned before, to be thyroid, to be insulin resistant is to be thyroid resistant. So oh. if we're going to put someone on a low carb or a ketogenic diet, they typically end up being much more insulin sensitive. And so mm -hmm. what happens is you actually need less T3 to get the job done. And so it, there is, there's actually been some documented studies looking at this. And so this is where some of the fear around low-carb diets come from. So there were some studies done in children with epilepsy who were on very strict um, ketogenic diets. Uh, and they found that in these kids, um, their TSH levels actually went up in the first month and came down. But in the long-term, T3 levels were lower. And so the, the concern was, oh, these kids are hypothyroid. But if you actually ask the kids, do they have any of these symptoms of hypothyroid? And they didn't have any, so they felt fine. And there's actually some evidence in adults now. It's a, a paper published last year showing that in adults who are put on ketogenic diets, there was um, actually a higher T4 concentration. There was no difference in TSH concentration. So in other words, the pituitary gland was happy with the current situation, um, but there was a significant lowering of absolute T3. So what that means is the, the pituitary gland was happy. The thyroid itself was pumping out T4 as it's supposed to. The patients felt well, but what was happening was the body was needing less T3. And so you were needing less T3 to get the same job done. So just because the T3 is lower on someone in a ketogenic diet doesn't mean they've got a problem. So if they feel good, and this is where it comes back to context, if they feel fine, then there's no problem. If they do have symptoms of hypothyroidism, um, then that might be something that needs to be looked into. Although, again, a lot of things get blamed on hypothyroidism. So not everyone who's tired has hypothyroidism. You know, it's um, It's a little bit more complex than that. But all up, I would urge everyone to, to not worry about um, low carb diets harming the thyroid. There's no evidence that that's the case at all. Yeah, the similar effect, you know, the people talk about the calorie restriction because on low carb ketogenic diet, people unintentionally, you know, they start to reduce the number of meals. They get into the intermittent yep. fasting and even they do the longer fast. So you, do you think that the people who are at risk of developing hypothyroidism or having pre-existing hypothyroidism condition, they should really avoid these like longer fast uh, not necessarily. So I think the people that run into problems with longer fasts are people who've got high reverse T3. So what happens is when you fast, your your T3 levels will go down a little bit, but that makes sense again, because you are very insulin sensitive when you're fasting. But what will normally happen is your reverse T3 will go up. Now, in a normal person or someone who feels well, that's not going to be a problem. It's doing its job, which is to slow the the body's metabolism down. You're going into hibernation. But if someone's starting a fast and their reverse T3 is already sky high and they're running into, they've already been um, suffering with with that for months before, if they go into a fast, then they will likely feel more tired and feel more cold and feel um, more sluggish. So they're really the patients we need to watch out for. And I, I forgot to mention before, one of the other groups of people we see with high reverse T3 is people who are just chronic dieters, who are yo-yo dieting and starving themselves. So they will actually provoke a high reverse T3. So I think for the average person, fasting is not a problem for the thyroid, but low calorie diets can be because low calorie diets can push you into a state of malnutrition. So if but you go on to a- if a... somebody is like very much fat adapted then? Mm. In no, then it's normally not a problem. It's normally not a problem. Some people will notice they feel cold when they fast, um, but when they reintroduce feeding, their energy, their, their temperature regulation comes back and their energy levels come back. So we don't normally see too much issue with people fasting um, when it comes to thyroid um, health, as long as when they are eating, they're meeting all their nutritional needs. And uh, like some... Uh, times what happen is like people they are overweight they are they have hypothyroidism and when they switch to the low carbohydrate diet they do see good results they start to lose weight but uh, at some moment what happen is like you know their TSH level start to rise and then uh, even their cholesterol level rises and do you think that at that moment we should make some variations in the 
macros or specifically the carbohydrates? Uh, potentially, I think in someone like that, um, if their TSH is rising, they need to make sure they don't they're not malnourished, so they're not iodine deficient or they're not zinc deficient or iron deficient. That's most likely what's going on. Um, so, so I think I'd be really looking into their micronutrient um, intake and making sure they're getting enough of everything there. Um, so that that'd be my first thought on that. Um, and the other thing is, are they getting, are they in too much of a calorie deficit? So if they're in too much of a calorie deficit, you know, T3 will go down. Uh, and so it can be useful, but um, in some ways to keep your thyroid happy, it's probably actually better to eat a little bit more and then move a little bit more or do more exercise rather than running a better, a bigger calorie deficit by just um, not having calorie intake. Because when you eat more and move more, you've got more opportunity to get all these micronutrients in. So it just makes it easier. Mm -hmm. And another thing is like, uh, as you are into this preventative health, and have you ever seen like somebody get off their thyroid medication with a lifestyle change? Yes, we have. Yep. it's I, I can't say it happens with every patient. Um, but in much the same way, like type 2 diabetes, if someone's been type 2 diabetic for only a month, it's much easier to reverse their type 2 diabetes. But if they've been a type 2 diabetic for 35 years, it's a little, little bit harder. It's the same thing with Hashimoto's. So um, for patients who've had you know 20 years of autoimmune attack against their thyroid where people have mismanaged it, then it's very likely there's not much healthy thyroid left or not enough to, to meet the, the body's needs. However, um, and we we're talking about this before the before the session. Um, we often will test thyroid antibodies, so TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies, on people who don't have a history of hypothyroidism. And in about ten or fifteen percent of people, you will see this latent autoimmune activity. So, so our attitude is it, that kind of person they're going to develop Hashimoto's potentially at some stage if things don't change. So that that's a that's another motivator for them is we can say, look, if you make sure your nutrients are okay, if you're avoiding the common autoimmune triggers, then maybe you're not going to end up being someone who's got a damaged thyroid in the long term. But does so, all the Hashimoto's, they have hypothyroidism? Uh, not all of them do. So so if you look at, um, you know, the general population, about 15% of patients have mm -hmm. positive antibodies, thyroid mm -hmm. antibodies. They're not all going to progress to overt hypothyroidism, but a significant portion of them will. So um, when you look at what causes hypothyroidism, if we look at twin studies, about 70% of the burden of Hashimoto's mm -hmm. is probably genetic mm -hmm. and the other 30% is environmental. And obviously being an autoimmune disease, uh, uh, interplay between them all is, is also um, possible. When you look at other diseases that commonly occur in patients who've already got Hashimoto's, um, celiac disease is common. Uh, type 1 diabetes is common. Vitiligo, which is a skin condition, is common. Oh. Uh, and certain types of um, atrophic gastritis and pernicious anemia are common. All of these diseases uh, sit on something called the thyrogastric cluster, mm -hmm. which is basically an auto, a sort of autoimmune sensitivity profile that um, seems to be genetically transferred in susceptible individuals. And it would seem that gluten is a recurring theme as as a dietary trigger amongst people on the thyrogastric cluster. So to me, it's it's poorly studied, but to me, anyone who's either got positive thyroid antibodies or you know already has another disease that's on this thyrogastric cluster, I think being gluten free is a very sensible thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about, you know, like we are talking about food and exercise, but the, another thing is like, you know, our mindset. Uh, do you think that that is also equally important because in today's lifestyle, we are seeing like people, they are in chronically worrying state, like they have overactive sympathetic state all the time. So that somehow could be the cause of hypothyroidism, do you think? Um, certainly that's going to drive the, the high reverse T3. So absolutely, that's something that's going to shift that balance um, in a negative way. Chronic stress also does impact your ability to produce T4. So it does have a few um, negative effects uh, on, on the thyroid axis in general. Mm -hmm. So I agree that you know chronic stress is not good for the thyroid. Thyroid doesn't like stress. Um, 
uh, as do all a lot of your other organs don't like it either. So I think that's an important um, part of things. So it's not just diet. We've got to look at exercise. We've got to look at sleep. Sleep is a big one. Mm-hmm. And we have to look at mindset because that sort of, yeah, that emotional health and mindset is going to have a big effect on your cortisol levels and your adrenal axis, which um, does play a big role when it comes to weight management, energy production in the body. So absolutely not to be ignored. So uh, do you think that we... Everybody like who's having a hypothyroidism condition, we must first look into their gut first. Like the gut health is important because some people talk like the thyroid. Hypothyroidism is the cause of gut health. Uh, and some people say like you, they have a poor gut health. That's why they have a hypothyroidism, you know. What actually, where it actually starts? like Very tricky because it goes both ways. So you're right. But it's something like Hashimoto's disease. Um being an autoimmune disease, it's very likely it originates in the gut. That's where we have a huge amount of our immune system. Um, so if the gut health is poor, <clears throat> we're going to be more likely to to get autoimmune diseases. So that's where things like leaky gut come into it. We want to avoid grains for that reason. Um, however, being hypothyroid also exerts a negative effect on your gut microbiome. So it's a bit of a chicken or the egg situation. It goes both ways. So um, gut repair one way or another is an important part of healing if you have a thyroid condition. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So uh, how do you manage in your clinic, like your uh, low-carb clinic? I have seen that you people are following a holistic approach. So what other than like food you really take care of in your patients? Like being a health coach, we everybody of us must take care of those things. Um, so yeah, the food is our priority first and foremost, but we, we want patients to be exercising, for instance, and we ideally want patients to be doing resistance exercise. So that's really a focus for us. Most people don't do enough resistance exercise. <clears throat> In fact, over, over exercising with cardio can be um, counterproductive as well. And that's something a lot of people naturally gravitate towards, especially our female patients. Um, as you mentioned already, stress and mindset is huge because it also helps people change. So, you know, getting their mindset right helps them to change their diet, which can be difficult for some patients. Um, and, you know, I guess they're the sort of main areas we would look at for patients. Yeah, it is a holistic approach, though. So we don't want to just look at diet. Yeah. So uh, for our viewers, I just want you to tell, like, you know, what are the do's and don'ts when they switch to the low carbohydrate diet if they already have, like, pre-existing hypothyroidism condition? Like, it could be, like, food, exercise, or whatever you want. Yep. I think in terms of do's, do make sure you're getting all the nutrients you need. In fact, it's ideal to be almost getting a surplus of all of the things I mentioned. So iodine, iron, zinc, selenium vitamin D, vitamin A. So you got to have a strategy of how you're going to get all of that. Um, Especially if you are vegetarian or vegan, it's going to be a little bit more tricky. But even if you're not, um, you you do need to get them from somewhere. Do make sure you're getting adequate protein because protein deficiency is a problem for everyone really. It can cause so many different problems. Um, And do make sure you're being holistic. So you're getting some movement, ideally some resistance training and making sure your sleep and stress levels are, are controlled. In terms of don'ts, I think don't jump straight into doing long fast if you're not fat adapted. If you've got a thyroid condition, that's likely to be counterproductive and you're likely to not feel great doing it. Um, don't force a calorie deficit. So don't don't restrict calories when you're hungry. If you're hungry, you should be eating ideally. Um, and, and don't be suckered in by lots of supplements that are out there. <laughs> Yeah, that's important. So we yeah. have uh, questions from our viewers. The one question is like, can you explain the connection between long-term soy and soy products consumption in disturbing your thyroid profile? Like, um, so generally speaking, we're not huge fans of of soy products because they they can cause lots of different issues. Not not least of all with estrogen balance. Um. But some of the compounds in soy products can can have a negative effect on iodine metabolism and therefore can have a negative, negative effect on thyroid function. So generally speaking, um, we would prefer our patients to not have soy products mm-hmm. because they're typically used in, in, in place of much, much more nutritious things like dairy. However, for some patients, um, you know, especially if they're vegetarian or vegan or if they're just no other good protein options, then, then you can use it um, uh, strategically. 
So another question, Dr. Alex, but you know, somebody is asking about the temperature, but okay, the question is actually like somebody is on levothyroxine or mm -hmm. uh, how do they know like they are on a higher dose, which is really required by the body? Like what are the few symptoms that they should really look into? Like if it's on a higher dose or if they are like on lower dose, some specific... Yeah. Um, so we look at their blood test first of all, look what the TSH is, look what the T4 is. Mm -hmm. um, if their TSH is going down and if their T4 is on the higher end of normal, then they're usually signs that maybe they don't need as much and they can wind it back. In terms of how they're feeling, that's also a sign. So it's best, it's ideally done the opposite way. When you start a medication, you monitor closely how they're feeling and if they're, if they're feeling better, you know you're at the right dose. But if someone's concerned they might be on too much, there's a chance they could be getting hyperthyroid symptoms, so symptoms of an overactive thyroid. So usually jitteriness, um, tremor, anxiety, or anxiousness, difficulty with sleep, um, sweating, excessive sweating. They are some signs of um, potentially too much thyroid hormone. And thankfully, it's easy to sort of assess whether that's the case is you just drop the thyroxine dose back a little bit and then retest in four to six weeks and um, and see whether you're better or not. But what are your thoughts on like basal body temperature? Like, you know, people uh, nowadays are measuring their basal body temperature the first thing in the morning. Well, that could, you think that that's a... Um, I must say it's not something I do for patients. Um, some patients with hypothyroidism will report the basal temperature is lower. Um, but I, from a practical sense, I think you just ask them, do they feel cold? Usually when their basal temperature is low, they feel cold or you feel their hands and they are cold. Like if they're um, sweating a lot, does it mean like they are on a higher dose? So if they're sweating, that's usually a sign of hyperthyroidism. So people who are hypothyroid usually are dry. Their skin is dry, their hair is dry. Um, so if there's excessive sweating, um, it could be a sign of over-replacement. That being said, there's other, you know, there's other causes of excessive sweating, you know. Not least of the menopause. That's a very common um, symptom yeah. of menopause as well. Or autoimmune disease. Oh, okay. So now I think I should invite uh, Anup Singh and Shashi Kantayangar. They can join us and they can, you know, give you a vote of thanks or they would like to have some few words with you. Because sure. we don't have more questions now from our viewers. So uh, Shashi Kantayangar and Anup Singh, could you please come? Actually, Sasikan sir is in a breakout room, ma'am. Okay. So, Anup Singh, you can join then us. Okay. So, in the meantime, we can take a few more questions from our viewers. Mm -hmm. So, somebody is asking, like, you know, like there are some studies, they show like a very high protein diet, like carnivore types of diet that one should really uh, look into, like when they have a hypothyroidism condition. Right, as in uh, a, a negative effect? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not aware of that um, study. Happy to have a look at it. But to me, there's no evidence that I could think of um, from the studies that I've seen that would suggest that a carnivore diet is going to be um, negative when it comes to thyroid health. I wonder whether they're, they're observing a low T3 and they're ascribing that to be a negative effect. Um, but I would... Having seen several patients with Hashimoto's improve on a carnivore diet, um, I think you need to be mindful of how they feel. So if okay. their T3 is a little bit lower, but they feel okay or if they feel fantastic, then to me, that's not a problem. That is a sign of profound insulin sensitivity, which is not surprising on a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So carnivore, you one can opt for the carnivore if they have a hypothyroidism. Yep. Yeah. And to that end, you know, that carnivore is, you could argue, is a type of AIP diet or autoimmune protocol diet. And the AIP diet is really designed for autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's. And in essence, on an AIP diet, you're basically avoiding grains and seed oils and sugars, which we you know, should all do really, um, but also avoiding things like eggs and dairy and nightshade vegetables and legumes, which are all potential autoimmune triggers. So it's a way of really trying to avoid the most likely immune triggering foods um, as, a, as a, like an elimination type diet. And when you look at that, when we look at carnivore, carnivore is like the ultimate AIP. You're avoiding everything except meat. Yeah. So, so for some patients, that seems to be the answer. Mm -hmm. 
because for whatever yeah. reason, they're profoundly sensitive to certain plant toxins or compounds in plants and they just can't tolerate them. Because in AIP, a lot of fruits are also allowed. And if somebody is really type 2 diabetic as well, it's really difficult with the AIP type of diets. Correct, yeah. So an AIP diet's not really designed for diabetes, although you can make it low carb quite easily. But yeah, you're right. There's there's overlapping um, priorities in these dietary protocols. So uh, Shashi Kant Anger, he's here with us. So Shashi, could you please uh, continue with you? Yeah, I see. We still have solid 10 minutes. And uh, yeah. Jasmeet has been given this session because she's highly intelligent. And we know that she will ask the razor sharp correct question for you. Um, but I'll I'll take up some of the questions which has been given by some of the participants, uh, yeah, sure. either in the front end or in the YouTube. So can you explain the connection between long-term soy and soy product consumption in disturbed... Uh, that, that we have taken already. You are taken. You are yeah, taken. we have taken this Fine. Does excessive sweating has any yeah, correlation with hypothyroidism? Okay. I think she is a... You have taken all these questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Achha, do we have any questions from from YouTube or front end? And I think it is it is the right time to 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 address this. I think people can just check and give us some questions. Yeah, let me let me see on YouTube. Maybe definitely there will be something. I think they they also ask whether you know uh, a little diversion here is since doctor is also cancer specialist, so yep. <laughs> specialize in cancer. I'll say in a different way. Does this Seed oils have a solid connection to this. To cancer? Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty tricky to, to tease out seed oil intake and cancer because all the nutritional epidemiology data is just just, just junk. Um, however, seed oils, they, they do provoke a lot of arachidonic acid, so they shift, um, shift a lot of process in the body to be a pro-inflammatory state. And from basic principles, pro-inflammatory state is cancer-causing. Okay. So I, I would not be surprised if they are carcinogenic. It's going to be very hard to definitively prove one way or another. Uh, and studying carcinogenesis is hard because it takes place over 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but we already have many, many reasons to not be eating seed oils, um, not least of all, which they seem to provoke insulin resistance, which is a well-established risk factor for cancer. So yeah, whichever angle you look at it, seed, seed oils are bad. <laughs> That means it is, It is. I think uh, it, it's a combination of everything. It's a combination of high glucose yeah. level, high insulin level coupled with this uh, yeah. uh, 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 seed uh, oils uh, coupled with, yeah. Uh, how coconut oil is helpful in this hypothyroidism condition? You know, there is a question on YouTube like people are asking because. Um, I haven't seen any data specifically for coconut oil, but coconut oil should be should be safe to use in hypothyroidism. So um, it's mainly saturated fat. It's a heat stable fat. So um, I've got no problems with people using coconut products. In fact, coconut is coconut products are very useful on AIP for people with Hashimoto's because you can't have dairy. So a lot of the times people miss dairy, but you can use coconut milk. You can use coconut cream, coconut yogurt, all these coconut products. So for some patients on AIP, it's a real um, it's a real godsend to be able to use those products. So what about did you did we discuss hyperthyroid hyperthyroidism? There is one Actually, question. Uh, no, the one question, you know, Shashi, a uh, few days back, it came on our forum itself, you know, somebody posted from our group itself. So what they were saying, like, you know, they have very low value of TSH, like 0.5, something like that. But, you know, uh, and everybody just looking at the TSH level, they say, like, you know, it's uh, hyperthyroidism. But they don't even look at, like, you know, how much uh, T4 medications they are, how much it, they are taking. And sometimes, you know, people, they go for the blood test and they just take, like, half an hour or one hour before the blood work. And some people, they skip the medication the day they are going for the blood work. So is there any difference that like, they have to take care of? Yeah, for T so T4 has a long half life. So you know, in theory, it shouldn't affect the blood test whether you take the the medication or not. That being said, in the clinic yeah. we do see the difference. So normally, I tell people just when you're fasting, you're fasting. You don't have anything, and that way it's just easier to to um standardize it. But, but if their TSH easy. is that low, then they probably do have too much T4, mm -hmm. or there's a problem with the pituitary gland. Or um, they've got a, a nodule that's, that's producing its own thyroxin. It's always a possibility as well. 
and another thing is you know like uh, this pituitary gland it actually uh, it sees the the conversion which is going inside the pituitary isn't it because sometimes like people they have inflammation and in pituitary they have a higher level of t3 but in the peripheral cells they don't have that high value of t3 but their t uh, tsh is very low they have hypothyroidism but tsh is very low hyper sorry hyperthyroidism so the thing is like you know uh, the pituitary so uh, in pituitary we have only a single uh, deiodinase enzyme which is d2 that converts mm -hmm. the t4 to the active form of t3 but in the peripheral yep. cells we have all the other enzymes d1 d2 and d3 mm -hmm. And, yep. you know, the people, re they really get confused when they have very low value of TSH, but they have all the symptoms of hypothyroidism because they have a lot of inflammation. So this is the case that came to our day life forum. All the symptoms were of hypothyroidism, but the TSH was very low. It could be inflammation or what? Yeah, potentially, yeah. I, I, you'd probably want to make sure that all the other pituitary hormones are normal. So it's not a sort of pan hyperpituitarism situation. Um, but yeah, you're right. It could be that. And you probably, look, on that sort of person, you'd, you'd probably see a high reverse T3. So that sort of sensing oh. is not is not working properly as well. So basically, but in India, this reverse T3 is not very cost effective, you know. Yeah. Yep. Nobody uh, really, only few yep. people can really afford. So we yep. don't. So you would assume it's high. So we often do that as well because it's a cost issue in Australia as well. So sometimes you just assume it's high. And yeah. then work on work, work on root cause regardless. Mm -hmm. Jasmine, did we speak upon frank hyperthyroidism the time it is detected with all the symptoms? So the question is, can it be put under remission with any hyperthyroidism? Hyperthyroid frank hyperthyroidism without whatever Jasmine told. Frank hyperthyroidism. Hyper yeah, so Hi, so frank hyperthyroidism is is actually it's rarer um and thank and thankfully it's a lot easier to treat generally so standard medical procedures usually are, are quite effective with that um so it's two, two main causes one is you've got a toxic goiter so you've got a goiter that's producing too much t4 autonomously um and so either ha having a nodule cut out or having radio radio iodine treatment um, or a medication to help dampen the t the thyroid function, they're all effective options. Um, the other cause of frank hyperthyroidism is something called Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune disease. Um, we don't see a lot of that again because these patients typically are well served by the standard medical field. But Graves' disease is also one of those diseases that sits in that thyrogastric cluster, so it's an autoimmune disease. It's probably at least in part driven by gluten. So uh, again, if, pe if people can um, identify that they've got this thyrogastric cluster based on other diseases or based on their family history, if they if they go off gluten and certain other grains and other sort of foods we typically tell people to avoid anyway, then they might actually end up without these symptoms in the, in the first place. I can't say I've treated Frank Graves' disease or Frank hyperthyroidism with diet because these patients just get treated before they get to me. And often they're quite sick, so they're often hospitalized with you know cardiac issues or whatnot. Uh, I think, Shashi, yeah, I, think... I got one more question yeah. on my WhatsApp. You know, people are asking about the salt because nowadays we are seeing like in India, people are switching from the iodine Tata salt, which is you know fortified with the iodine, to the Himalayan pink salt. Mm. And do you think that we should not like uh, we should switch from one to the another, like from time to time? Yeah, so we get asked this question a lot in our in our clinic in Australia as well. So Himalayan salt has got some other trace minerals. It's got a bit of magnesium, a bit of potassium, and it tastes different, which and it's pink, which some people like. But it, it doesn't being a rock salt, it doesn't have iodine. So I think you have to think about what are your priorities and what do you need to get. And um, especially for a lot of people who are not eating a lot of seafood, for instance, iodine is going to be harder to get from other things. So yeah. to me, uh, you know, a little bit of magnesium or potassium, we can get that from other things. You get potassium from just eating some vegetables, whereas um, the iodine is a little bit more unique. And especially in India, you can't rely on getting it from your vegetables because the soil is quite deficient. So, And a lot of people in India don't eat a lot of seafood. So um, I would prefer um, people eat iodized salt or at the very least have that as part of their salt so maybe they yeah. mix and match some Himalayan in but I get a little bit nervous with people having just rock salt um, if they're not eating seafood because I think the the risk of iodine deficiency is, is not negligible 
quite high. Yeah. Fine. So we have come, really we are coming important. to the end of the session. Uh, uh, Dr. Alex, personally, I wanted to thank you for accepting this invitation. Uh, coming to India virtually in this uh, inaugural historic <laughs> massive conference and your topic I believe is the most most interesting and there are a lot of questions which are still unaddressed probably we will have a different session with you to address all this question because the questions on hypothyroidism is just unending people will ask tons of questions and we were anticipating that so thank you very yeah. much on behalf of uh, D-Life and uh, Metabolic Health Conference I want to thank you again for coming and my sharing pleasure. knowledge. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was a really nice session. So hopefully, hopefully your attendees got something out of it. Yeah. So namaste from India. Thank you.